This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I'd like to welcome everyone to Long Table. What what number are we now, Emma? 121. 121. And our speaker today is Donald Scrinzi, a fellow who doesn't need uh, too many interruptions. Sorry, I'm just going to say interruptions. Uh, it looked like Eugene Dabb actually was just trying to call me, um, which is rather strange. But um, at any rate, uh, Donald Scrincy is a uh, good friend and colleague, somebody I've known for a good number of years and somebody who I'm sure many of you know as well. He is a founding partner of Scrincy and Hollenbeck, one of the major law firms just across the river over in New Jersey. Uh, but he is known within our community as a um, widely recognized collector and specialist in medallic art. I've served with him uh, for a number of years on the uh, J. Sanford Saltis Committee. This is the major award that the American Numismatic Society gives to uh, living medallic artists. And more recently, I've been serving with uh, Donald on the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee, and he is somebody who um, always has something to say about uh, the current designs that we are considering. So um, Donald, it is my pleasure to turn it over to you and I'm very much looking forward to this. Okay, so my name is Donald Scarinci and I've been collecting um, um, art medals for a number of years and uh, a number of decades actually. And um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to give an overview today of um, of the art metal, um, uh, the contemporary art metal, and how we got here. And um, so the art metal uh, has its origins in ancient times, but most sculptors consider the work of the Renaissance artist uh, Pisanello as the, as the, um, um, as the beginning, and that's around 1435. Pisanello produced cast metals, um, and eventually the metal was engraved in the die and struck by hand, and then by machine until the middle of the 19th century when the Janvier um, reducing machine uh, was invented or its earlier, uh, or its earlier incarnation. And that allowed the large bas relief work of sculptors to be reduced and then struck into coin size or metal size objects, usually between 40 millimeters and 120 millimeters in diameter, not larger uh, than can be held comfortably in the hand. And that's uh, the interesting debate at the time um, of, of the Jean Vier was that. Um, um, you know, th these machines allowed uh, sculptors to replace uh, engravers. And uh, that debate rages today between the graphic artists and the sculptors. So there's an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting evolution there. Time doesn't permit uh, much, of, much more of a discussion of this history, but I'll make an attempt in the next uh, hour to give you an overview of the history and development of the contemporary art metal covering roughly the end of World War II to the present. The, um, I hope that this brief overview of the period, along with an approach to appreciating these handheld works of art, which I will communicate with some descriptive interpretations of some of the metals of the period will help place the work of contemporary artists in context for all of us. So my first encounter with a cast contemporary art medal happened at the ANA annual convention in July, 1994, for anyone who might remember that. Um, that was when I saw the AMSA exhibit called the New Metal, which was sponsored at the time by the Franklin Mint. And, and for some reason, uh, for someone like me, uh, who collected coins and, 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 and was accustomed to seeing representational or decorative art on coins and metals in America uh, up to that time, 
I, I didn't understand how to look at a contemporary metal in that exhibit. And like many of the numismatists uh, in Detroit in 1994, um, and perhaps like many of you today, uh, you're wondering uh, what are these things? And um, so I was, I was intrigued and I was curious about them. And um, the exhibit in 1994 made it very clear to me for the first time that the art metal had ceased to become uh, a representational or decorative object. Um, the art metal departed uh, from the uh, decorative arts and it rejoined sculpture. So the ideas of modernism and postmodernism had come to dominate the art of the metal as the metal resumed its rightful place in art as sculpture. Uh, so how did we get to that Franklin Mint AMSA sponsored exhibit in 1994? And for that matter, how did the metal come to look like the metals that you are seeing here today? Well, the trends and tastes of, of in the sculptural arts dominated the metal from its inception in the Renaissance up to, up to about the time of David d'Angers and in the 1930s. Even though Louis XIV positioned the metal as a commemorative object, the engraved metals through the French Third Empire following, followed the trends in the fine arts. Mark Jones said in his book, uh, the art of the metal, um, uh, the, the art of the metal, that work through David Danger, the three-dimensional nature of medallic art was increasingly emphasized. And the art metal, as opposed to the popular metal, began to be regarded as a specialized form of sculpture. Through the developments uh, of, of artists like Ondine, in this, in, this, in this piece, and Chaplin in France, the art metal was transformed from a sculptural art to a decorative art. By the Paris exhibit of 1878, this trend was clear. By the Paris exhibit of 1900, the transformation was complete. The metal was now an object of beauty used to adorn objects like furniture and small cases, doorknobs, and create a strong national coinage for awards that were being issued in various countries. So while sculpture continued to evolve like the fine arts as modernism with all of its corollary isms in the first half of the 20th century, the art metal followed the decorative art trend of Art Nouveau up to World War II, Art Deco between the two wars. And it wasn't until after World War II that the first truly modernist styled art metals were made. And obviously metal production was not a high priority immediately after the Second World War but artists did begin finding new ways of expressing themselves, such as in this medal by Andre Galti in 1945 to commemorate the victims of the Germans in World War II. While Galti probably intended to satirize Germans, the German style of medallic art, the effect here created one of the earliest medals I found that could be called modernist. The obverse is a male prisoner chained as if crucified on a swastika and the names of Nazi death camps spelled out within the swastika. The, on the reverse, three prisoners stand behind bars with the swastika encircled by barbed wire. 
Another early modernist sculptor, Raymond Jolie, produced Andromeda in 1948 for the second series of cast French art medals. The second series was all cast. And if you recall, the first series um, of art medals consisting you know, of about 100 medals, uh, they were all struck. Um, since he perceived, since Jolie perceived that the world could never be the same after World War II, Jolie began depicting classical themes in new ways. Here, the winged Perseus, uh, the, 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 the winged Perseus uh, prepares to slay the dragon and rescue the naked, manacled Andromeda. On the reverse, birds are set free, flying out of the open cage. Jolie, of course, went on to become the chief engraver of the Paris Mint in 1961. By the 50s, Finnish, Finnish artists began making medals in a new modernist style. They were inspired mostly by Goethe Quist's blend of the German style of the Munich of the Munich School and the Art Nouveau style of her teacher, Eric Limburg of Sweden, as in this medal made in 1948. So compare this medal uh, by, by Quist to Kauko Rasinen's first medal made in 1952 for the Olympics. The athletes' heads with laurel crowns superimposed over the Olympic Stadium look much more like Quist than the Art Deco style that most people erroneously attribute to early Rassenen. The reverse of Rassenen's Olympic medal depicts similar styled athletes holding torches. Also, by the 1950s, uh, Artist, uh, Polish artist, uh, Zofia Demkowska, uh, may began to inspire a generation of artists with medals like Flower and Jug made in the 1950s. And all of, all of, uh, all of Zofia Demkowska's uh, medals are extremely, uh, are almost impossible to find anywhere. They were made in very limited editions of two or three. Um, but the obverse is the human face in, in this medal. The obverse is, is the human face, simple but contemplative, transporting a heavy load on her head. The reverse is a still life, but the flower, the object of beauty, towers over the more functional jug. As the reverse of a medal of Pisanello conveys something of the aristocratic patron on the obverse, uh, the reverse of this medal shows the beauty in the mind of a simple woman doing her everyday labor. The straight head parallels the straight stem. The head holds something heavier than itself on the obverse. The stem holds something heavier than itself on the reverse. I can't resist the comparison of this medal to Kite uh, by Magdalena Dubraca made in 2006. And when you see this metal in the hand, um, it's about 150 millimeters. It's a very large and very heavy, very three-dimensional uh, object of art. And uh, I consider Dubraca's work to be the full flowering of the Polish style uh, began by Demkowska. By the early 1960s, the art metal was reborn and modernism with all of its corollary isms was the trend. The metal had finally left the world of the decorative arts where it had been since the Paris Exposition of 1878 and rejoined sculpture. The appointment of Pierre Duhay as the director of the Paris Mint in, 18, in 1961 was second in importance for the contemporary art medal only to the creation of Fedem in 1937. 
Duhay used his rather lush marketing budget uh, for the Paris Mint to promote a new third series of French art medals, which he launched in 1963. His deep appreciation for the work of sculptors like Joly, his first chief engraver, and, and Bezon, his second chief engraver, led to a burst of creative energy from sculptors of Paris, which spread quickly throughout the world. I'm showing Bezam's famous tribute to César in silver cast in 1970. Um, uh, and that's a boast that I own that. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard to find and, and an iconic uh, uh, medal by Bezam. Uh, the French artists supported by the Paris Mint were some of the pioneers of modernist art medals like Galtier's homage to Toulouse-Lautrec, 1964, one of the first medals for director Duhay's third series of art medals, the painter's broad brim hat uh, dominates and becomes the field of the medal's obverse while an exhausted but erotic dancer at the Moulin Rouge pushes out from the bronze canvas of Galtier's medal on the reverse. Throughout Europe, artists were producing handheld sculpture as vital, alive, and multidimensional as any of their monumental siblings. Look at this piece by Polish artist uh, Bronisław Kromi. That's, this is called Animal Lover's Medal in 1961, which uses three owls and a piercing, which allows the third owl to be seen on the reverse. This medal unites the obverse and the reverse with a piercing and may well be the very first medal to use that technique. In Portugal, Jose Aurelio had his first commercial success as a medallic artist with his Air France medal in 1966. Several years later, he made the Fondaco Calus Gulbenkian medal, in which in 1969 inspired a generation of artists and earned Aurelio the title father of the Portuguese art medal. Um, and that is how he is revered uh, among Portuguese sculptors today. Um, this piece was notably controversial at the time, but understanding it is the key to understanding the, Portu the contemporary Portuguese art method, um, where, where the medium is the message. The event commemorated here was the opening of the Gulbenkian and the celebration of its namesake's centenary, centenary, two separate things. It commemorates two separate things. Aurelio depicts the superior celebration, the first centennial celebration on top, and the secondary celebration, the opening of the building on the bottom. They're linked by four posts representing the four statute proposals of the foundation, charity, arts, sciences, education. The medal itself, is the expression and not any images contained on it. The metal is the message. The metal itself is the expression and not any of the images contained on it. And <coughs> this medal in 1966, I think is one of the most important commemorative, um, one of the most important contemporary uh, art medals uh, because of its incredible influence uh, in, 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 uh, among other artists, um, even, to, even up to today. To demonstrate just how much influence this medal had, let's look at Zhao Duarte's 150th anniversary of the Bank of Portugal, made in 1996. The medal is an antique counting machine to symbolize the age and stability of the bank. 
There's no image here. Uh, there's cast in bronze, no image at all. The metal itself is the message. Another good in illustration, again, from Portuguese artist Helda Batista in 2007, Wheels of My Toy. This metal depicts motion by showing wheels jutting from the bottom of the acrylic case inside the case as if in a museum exhibit the coiled metal looks as if it will spring into motion the metal depicts motion itself by using objects in motion again from Aurelio's Gulbenkian metal to Batista's Wheels of My Toy for the contemporary Portuguese art metal, the medium is the message. Calco Rassinen in the 70s saw many innovations in the art metal. Calco Rassinen um, perfected the multi part metal. And, and as best I can tell, uh, the first multi part metal was done in 1970. You know, two, two, separate, two separate metals that, that combine. And, and to cast that is, is, you know, is not an easy task uh, for, for artists. Artists tell me that's a very challenging thing to do. This was the first, and actually, there's one earlier than this that was actually the first, but this is. This was done the same year. Um, the, let, so let's look at Calco Rassinen's One Earth Medal for the United Nations Conference on the Environment. Um, uh, that medal was, a, was um, in 1992. And as the medal sits in the hand, it feels like a cocoon. It's tactile, right? We're now introducing the concept of touching the metal. You're not going to want to slab any of these things ever because the, the, the effect is the touch. And that's what makes these metals so special. The image of the woman's body on the reverse is folded within the confines of the metal, which here takes the form of an egg or womb containing life. The obverse has a woman's face with hair flowing around her in lines like the water that engulfs our planet and is necessary for our survival. Open the metal and inside the womb is a fully grown woman in a fetal position. On the left, a grid image of the earth is an overlay to the human figure suggesting the earth as mother. On the right, there are no latitude and longitude lines, just a woman um, uh, naked and vulnerable. The two halves of this metal illustrate the human body nurtured by the earth on one half and the human body without the earth's embrace on the other half. These images juxtaposed remind us that while we can and sometimes do view ourselves as separate from the earth, we are not separate from the earth at all. Toivo Jatinen, another Finnish artist, produced a two-part metal called Pisanello in 1973. It has the portrait of Pisanello, which may actually be Jatinen's self-portrait on the obverse in Jatino's in Jatinen's delicate shadow style. That's You'll see that style in all of Jatinen's work. The reverse opens to, to one of the Pisanello's medals and reveals its negative impression or cast on the opposite panel. Jatinen's reverse shows Pisanello's most important contribution, his casting technique. By compelling the viewer to actively touch and experience this process themselves. The metal has become an, a, a, a four-dimensional object, touch 
is an important part of the experience of contemporary art metals. And it, that remains very much so uh, to the present day. The American art metal, um, the American art metal abandoned the decorative arts later than most countries. And I consider the, I consider Fiedem 1987 as really the official demarcation point for this, for this transition in America because of Miko Kaufman's uh, American delegation medal um, that, that, I, that I'm illustrating here. However, the groundwork for that exhibit was laid many years in order to have a feedum, and that was the first feedum in the United States. Um, and in order to have uh, a feedum, um, uh, uh, the groundwork for that was laid at the Pennsylvania State University um, with a symposium that John Cook, uh, who was a teacher there, along with Eugene Daub and a handful of, of other artists began exper experimenting with modernism in metals. They had been exposed to contemporary art metals from around the world through freedom conferences, international freedom conferences, and they were very much influenced to express themselves in this new and modern way here in America. In 1984, the International Medallic Art Workshop brought many uh, international artists, some of whom I mentioned earlier, uh, to America at Penn State. The <coughs> exhibition was called The Resurgent Art Metal. The Resurgent Art Metal. And um, it traveled to four museums and had a tremendous, you know, an incredible influence on American sculptors. So by Feedem 1997 in Colorado Springs, the first Feedem Congress held in the United States, the American exhibit was decisively and powerfully modernist. Paul Manship and Karen Worth, and we'll start with Paul Manship, a, a few words about Paul Manship. Um, he's the bridge, really, between the art, you know, Karen Worth is the bridge between the Art Deco of Paul Manship, which I show here to illustrate a metal that you all know, um, you know, and the modernism of Don Delu, Donald Delu in Hail to Dionysius, um, Society Metalist number two. You, you see the quintessential Manship style here. Notice the straight, deliberate lines and the rectangular forms in the beard, the hair, the grapes. This is a bold image with a subtle humor. The, as Manship himself said about this medal in 1930, which was highly controversial at the time, it is, quote, symbolic of a present day attitude to certain restraints of the times, unquote. And of course, he was referring to prohibition in America. Uh, so now look at contrast this Paul Manship medal to Karen Worth. Um, um, Karen, Karen, Karen Worth, this is Karen Worth's Jacob Wrestling with the Angel made in 1975. Notice the straight lines and triangles in the angel's wings and in the legs of the two figures. The clothing drapes nat naturally over the wrestling figures, even though the lines are more straight than curved. Notice how, notice how the 27 is cut into the metal and forms the palette for man and angel. The metal was originally prepared for the Judaic Heritage Society's celebration of Israel's 27th anniversary, hence the 27th. What a, what a clever way to state the metal's function and integrate the function into the design the way Karen uh, did here. Um, Karen, Karen Worth uh, won the Saltus Award in 1979, and she and Anthony Fridakis are the, are the last 
living students, and Karen is still living, uh, the last living students uh, of, of uh, um, as, um, with, that show the influence and the training uh, of Paul Manchek. Karen, they studied under, they both studied under Paul Manchek. Karen Worth, um, Karen Worth's work shows this influence as well as the influence of Donald DeLue, work she clearly admired. To see DeLue in Karen, in, in, Karen, um, in Karen Worth's work, look at these two medals side by side. On the left is the medal by Donald DeLue, sculpted in 1975. On the right is Karen Worth's Brook Green Gardens medal of 1982. Notice the somewhat elongated male figure. He is muscular and curves gracefully as if in dance to form an arc in parallel with the metal. For these figures, the round bronze surface is a boundary. It is a limitation from which the figure tries to break free. Yet each figure is at peace in the moment. The Dulu figure finds his place with the bird in his hand against the sun and its rays. The Worth figure is at peace in play with animals around him. The Dulu figure floats in the air as it always does in Dulu. The Worth figure is grounded. And for both artists, the exaggerated muscles and the elongated stretch imply stillness in effort. As I said earlier, the American art medal evolved quite rapidly in the 1980s. And by the mid 1990s, caught up to what was happening with medallic sculpture in the rest of the world. And I want to show you two medals by Marcel Jovine that illustrate this rapid advance. Both were published by the Society of, Metals, of Metalists, uh, a group affiliated with the Medallic Art Company, uh, which has a, a very nice series of, of very affordable art medals that can all be collected today. Um, the, uh, the, the Medallic Art Company used the Society of Metalists to promote um, uh, the art medal from 1930 to 1995, and both were popular sellers. And, um, and the ANS as a commercial, the ANS has a book uh, by David Alexander uh, that uh, gives you the complete listing and very beautiful pictures of the Society of Medalist Medals. Uh, so if you're interested in the Society of Medals, pick that up. And if you're interested in the ANS medal, uh, pick up Scott Miller's book on, on that subject, um, which is also a, an amazing piece of scholarship. Um, both, um, you know, so bo both of these things were published. So, so both of these medals uh, that I'm referring to here were published by the Society of Medalists. Um, uh, Joe Vine's Dreamer of Dreams, in, in the 76, that's the one on the left, is, is a 76 millimeter issued at the beginning of the decade in 1980. It illustrates a unicorn on the obverse and, and the adaption of a Gothic tapestry of the unicorn on the reverse. Jovine was fond of using the metal's two-sidedness to contrast old and new. So, so, so the, this metal shows a strident muscular, confident unicorn um, charging forward in a gallop on the obverse. And it creates a very modern depiction of this legendary creature. The reverse depicted here is an adaptation of a Gothic tapestry and depicts the more classic Renaissance image of a unicorn in the center. Jovine is also contrasting his 1980 unicorn with the Renaissance version of the unicorn depicted in, uh, in Pisanello in the medal of Cecilia Gonzaga. In this, this, this medal 
uh, on the on the left is from 1447. Of course, not this particular one. I don't own the original of that. Um, but the um, but the um, 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 this is this is uh, Jovine's Jovine's unicorn is still uh, intemperate and out of control, suggesting an unrequited love or a dream of love not yet fulfilled. The the before the the the, the before to Pisanello's after uh, Jovine is the before to Pisanello's after. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote. Um, um, wrote of the unicorn that uh, through its intemperance and not knowing how to control itself, for the love it bears to fair maidens, forgets its ferocity and wildness. And laying aside all fear, it will go up to a seated damsel and go to sleep in her lap, and thus the hunters take it. Jovine said of this metal, quote, to the dreamer of dreams, the unicorn is a reality and never more alive than when we need him most. Ten years later, in 1990, the Society of Metalists issued another medal by Marcel Jovine. This medal does not conform itself to the 76 inch round disc in order to communicate. It uses a 100 millimeter convex shape to deliver its impact. Again, Jovine uses the metal's two-sidedness to contrast two versions of the creation story and two very different philosophic, philosophical perspectives about life. One side is a three-dimensional model of Michelangelo's scene from the Sistine Chapel depicting the creation story from the Bible with the spark of life in the center. The other side is a spiral of connected and evolving life forms leading to the figure of man in the center. Jovine said, quote, the evolving life forms suggested the spiral started at the lowest point of the rim and marching up to the raised center where I placed man, thus resulting in the convex configuration. The other side re resolved itself as an obvious concave surface, an ideal arrangement to place the firmament on a dome-like shape accepted by ancient man as a concept of a sky surrounding his world, unquote, by Marcel Jovine. The Society of Metalists produced only 12 more struck medals after this one and ended in 1995. The Medallic Art Company had demonstrated its superior technological skill at striking medals of different shapes and patinas, but most artists had been returning to cast medals at lower cost and allowing for smaller editions. The vast majority of contemporary art medals produced today and exhibited at the, at, at the Biennial Feedom Conference or at art galleries like Mexico's Rack, Rack and Hamper, which is now uh, about to reopen in Jersey City, I'm pleased to say. Um, um, these, these medals are the vast majority of what is being produced by contemporary artists today. Uh, so I hope that. Um, I hope that you um, uh, that, that that you like my talk, and that um, and that people here today will will help flame the fan of interest in these amazing pieces of handheld sculpture. Donald, so thank you. That that that's really wonderful. Um, one of the best overviews of uh, the contemporary art metal that I've heard. Um, ever actually so um i'm sure there must be some questions uh, I, I see austin is your hand raised 
Yes, sir. Yeah, I just um, I wanted to note that um, I just got off the phone with Mashiko moments ago, and she said that she that was having trouble with her the with Zoom. She followed visually, but that she would uh, she would rewatch the recording on Monday. But she's she's here. Uh, Lovely. That's very nice. Very good. Do we have any questions? I'm. I'm... Uh, if, if you do, just uh, feel free to just ask. I'm, I'm not seeing any hands right. Oh, Michael, Michael Winner. Thank you for this um, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to comment. I, I, I particularly enjoyed your interpretation of the resonant two-part medal on uh, the United Nations Environmental Conference. And the reason being is that I'm actually a climate scientist and I've been an author on the uh, two of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, which is the descendant of that conference. And so um, it, I have that medal, a particularly meaningful one to me, and I really enjoyed your interpretation of it. Um, I'm gonna dig it out and look at it again. So thank you again. Thank you. Ira. Donald, it's Ira. Hi. What do you mean by modern? Because your modernity started 50, 75 years ago or more. And in each generation, they considered themselves modern. The definition of modern is simply to be in opposition to a preceding style. And that definition of modernity goes back to Pisanello. <clears throat> Okay, so the word modern <clears throat> and modernism has weight in your presentation, and yet I don't really understand what you mean by it other than this basic definition that they are changing their point of view and their technique. That's precisely the definition. So, so you think that modernism is not a metaphysical thing. You think that modernism is a trend. Modernism is is a is a neat is a neat uh, label uh, that art critics placed on um, on a genre on a genre of art uh, before World War II. Um, but it didn't it didn't really the the you know the the interesting fact is. You know, versus the decorative arts, right? Uh, modernism would be, in in as applied to sculpture, would be considered um, something that relates to the sculptural. You know, it's, it's it relates to you know what what we know as sculptural arts, but um, uh, but not uh, you know, but not um, you know, in and in other forms in in the in the art metal form, it really flowered only after World War II. Right, it was late. It was the the medals followed the trends in the decorative arts prior to World War II, and you know, and 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 you see that everywhere except in the German medals of of you know people like you know Gertz and you know and you know you know the the um, you know you you know and um, you know some some of the early um, uh, Eberbach. You know some of the early German artists, um, which you know it was more of a German expressionism style um, um, during World War One, World War Two, very different than what the French were doing, which was they were wrestling with how how with Art Nouveau just didn't apply anymore to as a term. It wasn't really a good style to depict the horrors of the war of World War One, and so Art. Deco kind of emerges from that, but it, that's all in the decorative arts, and those and those those labels that art critics apply are for the decorative arts, and and for uh, the fine arts uh, and for sculptural arts, um, it's different. It's they're different labels, and modernism is one of those labels. So the point here is that is that the art metal um, um, shed its Roots uh, in the from in the decorative arts and began to become sculpture again 
just like it was for David d'Angers in 1835. Why, why do you think, why do you characterize earlier medals as decorative art at all? From the point of view of logic, I'm not talking about how art critics labeled medals as decorative arts. I understand that that's just a historical weirdness, but the medals of the popes, the medals of the 17th and 18th century were highly formal things. They were not meant as decorative arts in the sense of hanging, you know, uh, on a piece of furniture routinely, although Renaissance medals were inserted into pieces of furniture. We know that. But that wasn't the way they presented themselves. They presented themselves in a highly formulaic way that I think deserves respect. And just to leap forward to your Society of Medals uh, examples that you finished your talk with, they all recapitulate classical forms, these bodies with muscle definition, these artistic posturings, they are a return to a much, much earlier form, quite in contrast to the stuff that you showed from Finland and in the early 60s. So I, I see a broadening of the base, but I don't see a Whiggish progression in one direction. That's why I asked what you meant by modern, because to me, modern has always been there. And in fact, the change in metals is a broadening of the range of expression. That's undeniable. No question. P Pisanello would have been called modern and in, in his day. No question about it. Thanks, Don. It was very stimulating. Uh, Donald, <coughs> Steve Scher here. Yeah, I enjoyed your talk very much. It was very good. The thing that um, occurs to me is uh, when I was in your position as head of the Solvus Committee, constantly the question came up and we used to joke about it. What is a medal? <laughs> you heard that. And I, heard that. I, I tried to define that. I wrote a sort of two or three page, def maybe you've encountered it in the archives of the Solvus Committee about what is a medal without putting any in in deference to modern and contemporary art without putting any limitations on materials or form or anything as a restriction for artists because i don't think they should be restricted but the question always remained what is a medal when you went to the fidem exhibitions you saw all of these different interpretations of what is a medal a lot of it seemed to be small sculpture and didn't and and could be defined in therefore many different ways so the boundaries which i expected to disappear did disappear but there is still the the lagging question and i ended up my little study by saying the one thing that did seem to be consistent was that they were commemorative whatever um and then the more I thought about it after writing that and saying, you know, that was the only thing that I could come up with as a definition, I said, even that really was restrictive. It really didn't um, define what is a metal. But when you're applying a term, that term has a definition. So what is that definition when you're saying that something is a metal? And you've probably wrestled with this since your collection is so... Uh, completely focused on the whole development of the modern metal, and there's that word modern again. Um, what? How do you respond to that? I, you know, you know, the art, the the question of what is a metal was really a, 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 the topic of the uh, 2000 uh, of the uh, I think the 1998 Feedem in London and. You know, there in, in a lot of articles exist in that in that um, in that in that volume, and a lot of or a lot of presentations were given at that feedum and uh, about this this question because by then um, people were you know really struggling with uh, these cast metals and and this Golbenkian metal 
um, really, really breaks, really breaks down the whole barrier. When you look at the, and, and Dick Johnson, you know, later, uh, after, Lon after London, uh, he, he started defining, he started calling metals medallic objects in order to avoid this definitional, uh, the definitional debate. So, um, you know, so whether, whether we call them, whether we want to call them metals or whether we want to call them medallic objects, um, um, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really a question of, it's really a question of how you, how you view it. That Gulbenkian metal um, doesn't depict anything. It's, it's the, the metal itself is the experience. And this, this um, so all of that changed pretty radically, um, you know, as, 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 as after World War II. And, uh, you know, and I'm fascinated by that. So, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I have a very liberal definition of metal. It's a, it's a generic, it, it's basically a very generic term, um, you know, that gives us all, that gives, that really is for us. It's really, it's really for collectors to, you know, say, okay, metal coin right i mean you know and plaquette, plaquette you know you have plaquettes which yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay at, at this point i would say that we are at the mercy of whatever the artist says is a metal um and of course now we're we're in the age of what actually is a coin in the age of bitcoin as well too so, yeah. so we are we, so we are actually we are that's a that's a great yeah. that's a great yeah uh, a couple of other questions here uh scott your hand was up or is up, I see. Yeah, 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 think a bit further here. Uh, anyway, first of all, excellent job, Donald. I expect no less. Thank you. Uh, uh, a few comments, but one, I thought you would go a little more into the modern metal, which to some extent has gone from the old definition of um, metal was you know, sculpture you can hold in your hand to, if you can hold it in your hand, it's a metal. But uh, one of the things that I have noticed, uh, and I do agree that metals did sort of become decorative uh, art objects rather than uh, more just generic sculpture from before, is that a lot of the sculptors who did uh, popular metals, struck metals and so on, also managed to do uh, some cast pieces for their own amusement that retained, you know, more uh, up-to-date artistic styles. I, Miko Kaufman is one of them. I mean, he did a lot of these very generic pieces, and yet there are some that really are very nice that we only really found out about after he died. Uh, I was looking at uh, some from Henri Huguenin the same way, some very standard drug pieces, but for his personal use, especially family members, he has some very nice cast pieces, uh, that, that being over 100 years ago. So I think that that's sort of like a fairly standard theme that I've noticed with uh, medallic sculptors all along. Yeah, I, Any comment to that? Yeah, I think I, you know, and Don, you know, Don Eberhardt, um, the, for, the, the, the former uh, chief engraver of the United States Mint, uh, who did some, you know, some really nice work and some award-winning coins, um, you know, in, in the 19, uh, and I always used to remind Don um, when I saw him in Washington uh, that, um, you know, whenever he gave us, whenever he gave the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee a portfolio that was less than, um, you know, that made us want to reject the whole, the whole portfolio, um, I, I always used to chide him and remind him that he was also the artist who did Fraggle Rock, uh, which was one of the one of the um, pieces of medallic art exhibited in that 1994 Franklin Mint exhibit that really captured my attention when you know when when I when I saw it. I couldn't I couldn't stop looking at that exhibit in 1994. I, I can't. I spent how many hours look, looking through those metals, and um, because they really, they really speak to you, and 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 the ob and the concept of touch being introduced as th this tactile thing, um, 
you know, it does create a dimension. And I have to admit, you know, when I, when I get a new metal, um, you know, it kind of sits on my desk for a little while, or it sits on my coffee table for a little while, and people touch it. You know, people who come into the office, they touch it, they have, hand it around. And, you know, and, and, you know, it really has an emotional impact. You know, and I think as long, and I think that's the case of any great work of art. A great work of art has to have, it has to speak to you on another level. It has to have an emotional impact. And, and you know, and some of these artists who are doing, who are working in this medium uh, are doing some incredible, incredible work. Uh, you know, and, and the day will come that uh, art galleries, um, art galleries, you know, more than just Mexico will be, you know, will be dedicated to uh, to contemporary art medals as people can appreciate that you can own sculpture in a New York City apartment, right? It, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be a gigantic Donald Ballou in, in a massively expensive big house in the Hamptons. It could be, you could have it in your New York apartment and you can have a lot of them and, and store them, touch them, feel them, and and they all carry the same emotional impact, um, and and in some ways even more so because you can really it's the touch of it that's so exciting. Uh, Daniel Daniel Wolf, I see your hand is up as well. Yes, good morning, good morning, and thank you for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I have a question that was sparked early in your in your talk when you showed a medal, a French medal dated uh, from 1878 and immediately came to mind the famous French Impressionism exhibition of 1874. And I, I watched a little further on in your talk that I saw medals with Art Nouveau style, Art Deco style, and you spoke about those. And I, I just thought to ask whether the Impressionism uh, revolution of the early mid 1870s also had an impact on the uh, medallic art. It doesn't seem to have, um, it, it doesn't seem to have made an impact. And, and because I think by then what happened, um, it, you know, the, the, the sculpture of David Danger, you know, you would very much call, you would very much refer to it, if we were to label it, you would call it romanticism, romantic, you know, romantic. Um, it has that, it has the characteristics of, of romantic, you know, but after David Danger, you know, it, it's the, the artists seemed to, um, uh, the trend somehow turned to um, um, uh, the decorative arts. And, and that was the period in the, in the 18, late 1860s, 1870s in France, that uh, that they were looking for these things to adorn um, furniture and so, you know there there there's Char Charpentier uh, did doorknobs you 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 can buy you can still on the secondary market uh, acquire a doorknob by by Charpentier and you know and um, and a lot of them were used for boxes or for furniture uh, to to decorate uh, boxes and furniture. So, 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 and, and, and also at that time, uh, they be, you know, they were very much used for, as award medals, um, you know, for, um, and in Europe, there's a tradition of using medals instead of, you know, we, we spend so much money on these plaques and trophies and things that everybody just throws away. Um, in Europe, the tradition was to produce a medal and those medals, uh, were produced in very limited editions and are still collectible today and are very artistic, but they followed along with the decorative style, which changed really, um, you know, in Germany uh, uh, around with, with, you know, be a little before World War I and in the rest of the world after World War II. That's interesting. Thank you very much for, for filling in that. What, what appeared to be a gap of, it, it is a real gap. Yeah. Thank you, uh, George. George Kuhe. Let's see your hands up. Hi. Uh, good work, Donald. Uh, just uh, as a comment on the Gulbeckian medal, mm -hmm. um, it might be a stretch, but 
the the uh, metal actually looks like the museum. It has trees in the background, water on the base, and it's a long flat building with four front doors. I don't think that's a stretch. Hmm. Very good. Uh, Robert Hoag, your hand is up. Uh, Robert, are you there? Uh, maybe uh, just, yes. Uh, oh, really, just an accident. I just wanted to say that I enjoyed the program. A nice overview and an interesting presentation. Thank you, Thank you Donald. Thank you. Uh, there, there are actually a couple of other questions in the chat here. Uh, David Gladfelder is asking on the topic of two-part art medals. Uh, our uh, dear friends uh, Jay Galst uh, uh, showed me an ophthalmologic medal in the form of two links that, when closed, took one distinct form and when open showed separate matching convex and concave forms. How could such a piece have been cast? He's asking. Well, you know, I I actually talked to Jeannie Stephen Solman uh, about 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 this. She one of my favorite one of my favorite medals. Uh, is is by Jeannie. It's called Doghouse in the Wind, and it's actually an eight part medal, um, you know. And and um, you know, and and it's and it's and it's very. And Jeannie told me, um, you know, how difficult it is to cast a multi part medal, and and um, you know, because each piece has to fit perfectly. You know, you know, but but when Jeannie did Doghouse in the Wind, that was in the 90s, in the 1990s. Um, you know, what Cal Rasanen did um was 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 very pioneer in 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 1970 uh with the with with what with what does appear to be the first two-part metal. Um, um so it, it's a very it is it, so you're right. I mean and you're right to say it's a it it's um it's a it's really a technological difficulty to produce these things. Uh, and then, uh, since we're at the top of the hour, one last question here from Thomas Lieb. He's, he's in the chat saying, American award medals from the late 1800s to right before the First World War, influenced by Beaux-Arts, tended to be figurative and allegoric mm -hmm. role. Uh, what part or do modern art medals play in the world of awards uh, today, presumably? You know, Zhao Duarte, um, with his with his um, with what what with what I guess Dick Johnson would insist on calling a medallic a medallic object, and you know, and so would so would Stephen Cher insist on calling it a medallic object. The Portuguese art medal, um, those are just amazing, um, and I just don't know why they they don't catch on here in America um, as as you know, place settings or, you know, or award medals, uh, you know, that, that have, that have, um, you know, that have specific purposes to them. Mm. Uh, there's no reason that they don't. It's just that uh, the, the tradition um, kind of in America doesn't, it never did exist. And, you know, and in uh, Europe, the tradition of giving medals uh, does seem to have waned uh, to a great degree. I, I will say though that uh, here at the ANS, we did commission a award medal from Duarte a number of years ago. This is the trustees award medal that uh, we give once a year to uh, the awardee at our gala, which of course is next Thursday. Um, those of you who um, haven't already bought your tickets, now's the time to do so. Um, and uh, we also just commissioned a new award medal from Eugene Daub uh, to replace the Huntington Award Medal. This is the medal uh, that we give for achievement in numismatic scholarship. And the medal that we have been giving over the course of the last century was designed by Emile Fuchs in 1905, 08, thereabouts, um, which was never actually really intended to be an award medal for this particular award. Um, and as we ran out of those medals, uh, we had a, a moment of, of decision whether we were going to restrike more of the Fuchs medals or just commission a new medal, a purpose of uh, purposeful art uh, uh, award medal, and uh, asked Eugene Daub to do it. So 
uh, stay tuned because that medal will be featured in an upcoming uh, uh, magazine article uh, at some point this year as soon as we get copies of it. In fact, they're probably being struck at this moment in uh, Wisconsin at Metalcraft. So. And, so and, Pete, and Peter, the, the ANS deserves all the praise in the world for being for taking a leadership role in in showing showing the American people that, you know, give create medals. I mean, what are we doing with these plaques and these are acrylic things and these trophies? I mean, I have boxes of them for my kids and they end up throwing them away, yeah. you know, and, and, but a medal is, is something special and it will last for a thousand years. Yeah. So, uh, Donald, I'd like to thank you again. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.